One of the first lessons I learned as a little kid was to stay out of the street. This is especially true if you're a little kid in New York City during the 1930s. You gotta watch out for those old-timey delivery trucks. Poor little three-year-old Herb was run over by one, and it crushed both of his legs. Doctors didn't know if he would ever walk normal. A few years later, he came down with rheumatic fever and was in bed for 10 months. His freshman year in high school, he broke his ankle playing basketball, and while still in a cast, went through an emergency appendectomy. Didn't stop him, but it slowed him down. And he really didn't start playing baseball and basketball until his sophomore year in high school. That's when Herb and his mom moved to Florida. One day, his team was in need of a pitcher. Outfielder Herb volunteered and would soon become their ace. Throwing six no-hitters, averaging two strikeouts per inning, and led the team to its only state championship. Not bad for a sick little kid who was run over by a truck and didn't really start playing sports until high school. So let's go to Herb's birthday party. Herbert, Jude, score, pitcher, lefty, MLB debut, 1955. I can't think of a better way to celebrate your 19th birthday. It's June 7th, 1952, and you just signed a contract with the Cleveland Indians for a nice chunk of change. Herb didn't graduate with his class due to all of his health issues, and MLB had a rule. Teams can't negotiate with a player until he graduates high school or turns 19. Herb showing on Cleveland's double-A team was not good, and in 1953 was sent down to their class A team, where he met and roomed with another New Yorker, Rocky Colavito. They would become lifelong friends and would forever call each other roomy. Both players were promoted to AAA in 1954, but it was Herb who made a splash, going 22-5 and and set an American Association record with 330 strikeouts and was the league MVP. 1954 was a good year for Herb. He was also named Minor League Player of the Year by the magazine The Sporting News, an award they'd been given out since 1936, voted on by the players. I was just talking to my dad about Herb's score. First thing he said was, Oh, threw hard. Lefty. My pop is sharp. He got Herb's autograph the same time he got all the other Indians' autographs. 1955, spring training in Arizona. I recently added up all my dad's Rocky Colavito autographs. He's got five. One from 1955, his rookie year. Same for the Herb score autograph you see in the thumbnail. He's got three from 1956 when Rocky was sent down to the PCL San Diego Padres. And one from Indian spring training camp in 1958. Getting back to Herb's story. Both Herb and Rocky were called up to the majors by Cleveland to start 1955, but again, it was Herb who was quick to make a name for himself. In only his third major league start, he faced the Red Sox and struck out nine batters in the first three innings and ended up with 16, too short of tying Bob Feller's record. Two weeks later, he would again face Boston, this time at Fenway, where teams avoid using a lefty, let alone a rookie, with the park short distance to the left field wall. A reporter asked Indians manager Al Lopez if he was worried about starting the lefty. Al smiled and said, he's not afraid to start Herb anywhere or against any team. He shut out Boston and had nine strikeouts. Nice way to start your big league career. Oh, it kept getting better. Because then you're picked along with Bob Turley to be on the cover of a new magazine called Sports Illustrated, May of 1955. So how do you become MLB AL Rookie of the Year? Herb did it by going 16-10 and and striking out 245 batters, setting an MLB rookie record that stood for 30 years. That might do it. But to seal the deal, Herb Gore became the first starting pitcher in MLB history to average over one strikeout per inning. That'll do it. He did all that even with the stacked Indians pitching staff. Somehow, he was able to fit in with that group and still became 1955 AL Rookie of the Year. Herb was even better in his second season, going 20-9. and in 1956. He had a better ERA and gave up less walks. His arsenal included a real hard fastball, a wicked curve, and a great changeup. And unlike in his early days, he now had control of all three. Herb's pitching style? Take a big wind-up. Turn his body away from the batter, then uncoil and throw, barely looking at the batter or the plate. And after his delivery was completely defenseless, that was evident early in the 1957 season during a night game when Herb threw a low fastball that Gil McDougal hit right back at him, smashing into Herb's face, breaking it, and injuring his eye as the ball ricocheted towards third base. Gil didn't even run towards first, instead ran straight to the pitcher's mound to check on the downed pitcher. Gil said he would quit baseball if Herb didn't regain his sight. 
But the guy who suffered many medical setbacks in his young life was back at it in 1958, and things were starting out pretty good for Herb. He got a few wins, then torn elbow tendon, and was done for the season. After yet another rehab, he returned in 1959, but had changed his pitching motion to avoid another injury and was never the same. Two great seasons in the majors, you're only 24 years old and basically it's over. Herb said he wasn't afraid of getting hit in the face again, but if you look at his record, before the injury, 38 and 20, after 17 and 26. So it had to be in the back of his mind. He blamed the change in his pitching motion for the decline. That's probably true, but you gotta wonder, and I'm sure he did, if he didn't get hit by that ball, how many more years he could have pitched at a high level? The Indians would trade him to the White Sox before the start of the 1960 season, and he would spend his final three seasons there with his old manager, Al Lopez. Not long after he retired, Herb was named Cleveland's play-by-play announcer, and that's what he did for the next 34 years. No Indians announcer did it longer. Herb's final call was Game 7 of the 1997 World Series. Again, a tough way to end yet another career. And it got tougher. A few months later, he was driving home after just being inducted into the Broadcaster Hall of Fame, and he veered into the path of a big rig. Bad wreck. And he was in ICU for a month. After a long and painful recovery, Herb was well enough in 1999 to throw out the first pitch on opening day for his beloved Indians. After a stroke in 2002, Herb would battle illness until his death in 08 at home in Ohio. He's in a few halls of fame as a player and announcer, and lived long enough for his 2006 induction into Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame. How respected was he? Mickey Mantle said Herb's score was the toughest AL lefty he ever faced, and Yogi Berra picked Herb to be on Yogi's greatest team of all time. That kind of respect isn't given by guys like the Mick and Yogi unless it's deserved. 